Uh, it's a pretty low-key map time this week. Uh, it's just going to be me, uh, David Weimer, uh, talking with Garrett Nelson from the uh, 11th All Map and Education Center. We're the two co-hosts of this, and today, rather than having a uh, kind of traditional interview like we've been having, we'll be uh, talking with each other and sharing some maps that we that we like to to think about. Um, Hi, Gary. Hi, Dave. Good to see you. How are you? Happy July. Happy July. Um, how, is, how, how air conditioned is your apartment? Mine is not very. <laughs> we have a we have one air conditioned room. Yeah. Uh, so are you in that room right now? Um, well, the air conditioner is very loud, so I turned <laughs> it off. I was saying that I we had to finish our Bending Minds series before it got too hot because I wouldn't be able to host them anymore. Uh, <laughs> maybe dr dripping in sweat. Yeah, um, but it went great. I enjoyed all the all the talks. Um, did uh... thanks, and these the map times have been so awesome. Uh, thanks for kind of uh, taking point while I was busy with Bending Minds. We've had so many yeah. awesome visitors. Yeah, there's been uh, I. Uh, a good amount of, of map material for people. Uh, mm -hmm. if they're so it's been good. I just, I um, noticed that the um, guerrilla cartography deadline for their new um, shelter atlas got extended to next week, I think. So yeah, everybody out there has been thinking about contributing. Get another week to send a shelter map to the guerrilla exactly. cartography folks. Um, and Susan, who is our, so <laughs> Susan Powell, who, works for Grail Cartography and also the map librarian at, at Berkeley. Um, Berkeley just announced, she sent an email and announced a really great initiative that they've been working on with the um, captured German um, World War II Nazi maps, uh, mm -hmm. which is really exciting. So they, they're cataloging and digitizing thousands of these um, maps from Nazi Germany that were captured by the US military and and distributed to different libraries around the country, um, including Berkeley and UC Riverside. And so UC Riverside was getting rid of theirs and they, Berkeley snatched them up. Mm -hmm. um, Don't I remember really you saying that your least favorite type of map were Nazis maps on one of our exactly. conversations before. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, or any, any map of the swastika on it, like, uh, I'd rather not. Yeah. Um, Easy to but dislike. It's um, yeah, so it's exciting. It's an exciting project, and it, it pairs well with what they've been. Stanford has been doing with their Japanese uh, military maps that were captured. So um, I'm excited to see what they come up with, and uh, hopefully, it's something we can add to with ours. Uh, do you guys have? I don't know if the. Do you guys yeah, have we do have some. Maps? Actually, we're uh, a project that we'll return to once we're somewhat back in person. Is there are there's a collection of objects that. Um, sort of belonged to us that had been at the various city library archives and depositories that moved across the city and are now at the um, city's archives in West Roxbury that need to be um, sorted and cataloged. And uh, amongst those items are captured military maps um, from the Second World War. So I'm not quite sure the extent of what's there, but we do have some of it. Yeah, that sounds great. Um... And will those end up coming to you all or are they going to stay over in their space? We, that That's kind of depending on what happens. As you know, space is always at a premium. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> I, 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 we don't know the answer to that just yet. But um, And I, I will note, I've been working uh, every, every day for the, this week, I've been working uh, hard with uh, Atlas Scope. Uh, using it probably every 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's been really helpful trying to find, a, I'm working on a project just thinking about kind of um, the history of uh, black folks in Boston and kind of where the geography of that. And so mm -hmm. looking at census records and uh, finding addresses and then going into Atlas Scope and figuring out what are the I'll have to remind me to send you, I have a, a few Atlas Scope um, notes and links uh, 
relating to Boston's Black history from when I spoke with the um, Bay State Banner. Um, okay. Actually, it's something that we talk a lot about uh, kind of internally is, um, you know, the fire insurance and real estate maps can be quite difficult for the history of groups that are, were uh, relatively didn't own property, right? Because mm -hmm. the, the maps tend to show the property owners. And sometimes if there's a really remarkable business, they'll show the business name, but otherwise mm -hmm. tenants, even you know, commercial and residential tenants aren't on the map. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, trying to find evidence on those maps for people who are not property owners uh, can be kind of difficult. So, yeah. Though you can, that can give you some other clues about who was landlords to whom, if you know somebody had a, a certain address, then referencing it to those maps yeah. is interesting too. Uh, no, for sure. The renter thinking about rent is a, always a fun, <laughs> a fun yeah. uh, exercise in political economy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't know, is there, are there any maps that you uh, are bringing to talk yeah. about? I've got one. Sure. You want to go first? Let's look at some. Let's look at some fun. Uh, sure. Maps. Yeah. This is the uh, after all. Exactly. Um, I'll. Uh, I'm just gonna. Let's see what happens if how it looks back here. Not that great. So I'm gonna just uh, turn my camera around. Um, so one of the things that. You know, one of the maps that I've been thinking about recently is this map of of Cuba by um, Erwin Royce and uh, Gerardo Canet, uh, who, you know, Erwin Royce is very important to the history of the Harvard map collection and kind of the history of uh, geological and kind of physiographic maps. Um, and this map has a really interesting story um, and kind of plugs in with some a lot of interesting kind of world uh, geopolitics. Um, the it's you know it's made in 1949 um, mm -hmm. with this partnership between Erwin Royce and uh, Canet, and part of what it why it comes to be is because of a kind of long-standing connection that um, Royce has with some uh, influential influential Cuban geographers, and also some of the relationships that Harvard had with Cuban institutions. And so uh, Royce, as many of you might know, uh, was born in Hungary in 1893. He emigrates uh, after World War I and come, gets, does his PhD in geology at Columbia, where he works with uh, Douglas uh, Johnson, and then is also um, you know, colleagues with and, and influenced by uh, Armin Lobeck in these kind of, um, this intersection between kind of traditional cartography and, and geological mapping uh, and geological diagrams. And in uh, the late 1820s, early 1930s, he comes to Harvard and is hired as the curator of the Institute for Geographical Exploration. And he's there for about 20 years. Um, and you know, Royce is a really important figure in the history of physiographic maps uh, in this, particularly in the kind of um, language of landscape mm -hmm. and how, how you communicate landscape uh, in, a, in a map. Um, and so if we zoom in on some of these, so you can see on a map like this, the kind of really close detail he pays to uh, what the landscape is and kind of how you can pictorially represent these kind of scientific features of, of the landscape. Um, and in 1929, he had made a map of, of Cuba with uh, Salvador Massip, who was a Cuban geographer, a kind of influential figure in, in Cuban geography, um, and also uh, working at, at Columbia. And through that relationship, um, NASA encourages Connect to come and study with with Royce for for five years, uh, for, for four years from 1945 to 1949 with a, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and that in those four years, Connect and and Royce collaborate on uh, an Atlas de Cuba, which is this uh, really important 
a national atlas for for Cuba. And this map actually uses uh, information from military kind of aerial surveys um, to get some of this information about the landscape. Um, and so, you know, I, it's a little different than some of the maps we've been looking at at map time so far. So I, I wanted to highlight it. We also have um, a really good collection of Royce's materials. So his travel notebooks, his, um, some of his papers. Um, and so that's another reason to highlight this map, but um, there's also the other thing I was going to show is that the Radcliffe Institute has some pictures of Royce uh, teaching classes, uh, working with students. And so this is one at Radcliffe. Um, I was happy. We, we realized this was Royce by, by kind of happy accident. We put this in our 200th anniversary exhibition, kind of just because it showed a map and showed someone teaching geography. And uh, Jason Van Horn, who studies Royce closely, visited the exhibition and was like, oh yeah, that's Erwin Royce. And I didn't know what he looked like. Um, and it, Radcliffe didn't have any metadata in, in there yet that identified as Royce. So it was nice to be able to add some metadata to this. Uh, and now Royce is in the, in the record for this picture at, at Radcliffe. Um, so that's the, you know, that's the map, um, cool. I picked out. I love it. One of the, one of the kind of themes that I'm most interested in is the, like the etymological links between landscape and nation building and regions. Um, obviously on that map, it's the Spanish paisage. Um, and, you know, of course in Spanish, the, that contains the país, which is mm -hmm. country or nation. Um, and you know this the uh, Spanish colonial world there's a there's a really strong influence of these um, European traditions of regional geography that connected ideas about landscape form to um, regional development and then by the twentieth century this sort of national enterprise, which of course uh, Cuba was in uh, during mm -hmm. that that period for, um, before Castro. Um, yeah. there's a really awesome book. I, I want to say Applebaum is the author. I'm forgetting off the top of my head, but it's about the choreographical survey of Columbia, uh, the mm -hmm. 19th century regional survey of Columbia. Um, and it's a really interesting historical look at the um, relationship between cartographic survey, landscape typology, geology, of course, in colonial rule. Um, and like the, the production of this like na national identity a, a, a nation composed out of these regions um mm -hmm. it's a it's a really great read that that uh kind of situates these european geographic traditions into the colonial project in the spanish americas mm -hmm. yeah that's interesting and, and how the you know, how you communicate some of that nation building in the map and and also how the map is kind of constituted of that nation building Exactly. Um, and those can be at odds. Sometimes they work together and sometimes they're at odds where mm -hmm. you know, a map like this is able to communicate to a wider audience mm -hmm. what Cuba looks like, how, what the feel of, of the country is, of the país. Um, whereas, you know, a topographical survey is, is able to give more control for uh, the government or for the military over that landscape, but not able to communicate that really to a, a wider audience, what, what the country is, what it feels like. Yeah, definitely. And and Royce was such a uh, like the visual language that he developed for the like in, the, in your words the feel of the landscape is so remarkable, right? To to kind of communicate this um, not air it's not a perfect aerial view, it's not a perfect scientific view, but it's um, you know it's based on on geomorphology and geological principles, but translated through this visual register that Royce developed. Um, it's, it's it, such a and look, yeah, looking at his notebooks is, is wild because he, he talks about these different kind of ad hoc methods for mm -hmm. um, cataloging the, the landscape or kind of um, getting its features. And one of them includes basically um, like not, like car surveying uh where you know being in the passenger seat of a car and yeah. making tick marks based on speed for how the landscape's changing yeah uh, and then have you know 
uh, collating those and, and getting your, your car survey of the landscape just, you know, while you're traveling between two yeah. places. Um, I mean, those fields, those field methods, those field survey techniques were such an important part of early 20th century cartography. There's a lot of uh, really interesting John Kirtland Wright stuff um, like that, too. Actually, mm -hmm. you know, Wright uh, retired to the Upper Valley of Vermont, New Hampshire, where Dartmouth is, where I spent the previous three years. Uh, and he did a ton of field sketching of um, like from mountain mountain tops and ridges mm -hmm. in the upper valley, um, which of course were based on his training and, as a geographer. Yeah, it's uh, something that doesn't get taught very much in uh, in the no. GIS curriculum anymore. No, uh, certainly not. Um, although I don't I don't know if you you saw the post that we did yesterday. Um, we um, Bonnie Burns, the head of geospatial resources at Harvard sent this uh, old promotional video from the U USGS from 1987, where they're using a digitizing table. I saw um, that, these, yeah, uh, with, the, cur with the, the cursor. Yeah, um, and I was really taken with this this overlap between the kind of plain table and the digitizing table. Mm -hmm. We really have nothing to do with each other as objects, but because of the kind of uh, embodied Kind of familiarity these people have they they end up being being similar objects yeah I, as i was looking at that i was thinking i mean it's still retained in a sort of echo um you know even in like these like icon tools like you have like a lasso tool yeah. or uh you know whatever the marquee tool on a uh, in a gis software image editing software is still yeah. a, a reference back to those or those are those yeah. earlier methods um yeah just like the uh the um, floppy disk save icon. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, um, were there any maps you wanted to? Yeah, actually, so let, me, let me flip my camera. It, in some yeah. ways, it actually like uh, matches really well um, with what you just showed. Um, I pulled this one up because I have a soft spot for White Mountains map. I grew up white maps of the White Mountains. I grew up in New Hampshire, and I was just up there uh, before the long weekend. Um, this is one of the first two Western, known Western maps of the White Mountains, Euro-American maps of the White Mountains. Uh, it's 1852, drawn by a guy by the name of Franklin Levitt. Uh, actually, our Boston Map Society colleague, Adam Apt, has, has written a little bit about Levitt. Um, and you can find some of that stuff online at the White Mountain Historical Society. But uh, this is such a fun map because Levitt was not a cartographer or a professional geographer. He was really uh, kind of a, uh, I don't, I, not a folk artist, but um, he was drawing what he saw as a resident of uh, the North Country. Um, he lived in Lancaster, which is right here. Uh, and this map has north up insofar as there are directions on this map. It's a very just geographically distorted map. Um, but this is Lake Winnipesaukee and the Lakes region of New Hampshire. Um, so, you know, beyond the top of the map would be southern New Hampshire and eventually Massachusetts. Um, and below the bottom of the map would be Canada. Uh, and this is basically the view of the landscape, uh, of the White Mountains landscape that uh, Levitt would have been really familiar with as somebody growing up north of the mountains. Um, so this is the really beautifully engraved panorama of the presidential range. Um, there's my, Mount Washington in the center, um, the Northern Presidentials, uh, at, as seen from this view. Um, this is Crawford Notch. Uh, one of the interesting things about this map is there's some folk names of, uh, of peaks and features that don't exist anymore. Um, if you zoom in here, I don't know if I can get focus on it. Uh, of course, we'll send out, I'll send out the link to this after the video, but um, Mount Whiteface and Mount Brickhouse are, that is not the, there is a Mount Whiteface today, uh, or one that we use the name Mount Whiteface for, but it's not this one. Um, these are, I think what's now Mount Bemis and Mount Nancy probably. Uh, but they're the only time that those particular toponyms appear uh, on cartography of the White Mountains. So they were, you know, a reminder that, uh, you know, these names were being kind of provisionally assigned by people living up here. But I think my favorite part about this map is, uh, you know, now 
with Interstate 93 being by far like the most important tourist corridor to the White Mountains, we kind of think of Franconia Notch and the approach to Franconia Notch is really the center of the of the tourist uh, site. But there was no I-93, obviously, in, in 1852. Um, there was a stage route going north from, um, that's Plymouth, uh, and uh, it was really the route of the Boston Concord and Montreal Railroad, which up what's now New New Hampshire 25 um, cuts over the pass to the Connecticut River and then north to uh, Wells River and Littleton from there. Um, or in the very opposite direction, if you were coming from Maine, uh, you would have come up the uh, Atlantic and St. Lawrence Railroad, um, which cut through southern Maine, uh, up through that's Gorham, New Hampshire. Uh, so that you know, the tourist economy was, of course, just getting going at this point. The White Mountains were only just becoming some place that people wanted to go rather than a, you know, economically unproductive uh, landscape. Uh, but those rail corridors were how people got there. And, and you know, those rail corridors are, are not used for passenger rail anymore. Now uh, the interstate highways are how we get to the White Mountains. Uh, and the difference in perspective is is kind of striking, right? Like what what is the front of the White Mountains? Where, what do you, where are tourists dropped off when they, when they see it? Um, You've got these uh, nice little illustrations too of um, it's hidden behind the inset map here. Let me see if I can pan over. That's uh, that's the Crawford House. Um, there's another one down here. Um, I think this is the Station House in Gorham. Oops, I'm, I'm zooming too much here. <laughs> I don't know if I can do it with one hand while I hold my phone with the other. Um, da -da 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 -da. Anyways. Uh, you know, this this is right at the dawn of the um, of Anglo American tourist economy in the White Mountains. Um, of course, uh, you know, as we say uh, in the American Transform show uh, many times, you know, this 19th century period is striking in the way that it has written the previous uh, American Indian set, uh, tribes completely off the map. Um, they're not even shown here in a kind of picturesque way, which uh, later became one of the you know, white tourist selling points of these these sorts of landscapes was this romanticized and um, kind of made up uh, type of Indian uh, culture for tourist consumption. Um, there is this weird little um, picture of somebody hunting. Um, what they're hunting, I, I've always, I think it's just a puff of smoke. I don't think there's actually like a, a target unless that's supposed to be a like a panther or a mountain lion in the distance. I've always wondered about that. Um, it's, it's hard to tell the, what <laughs> what this guy is aiming at. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's a, quite possible. Um, so yeah, like like I said, Adam Apt has written a bit more about Levitt. Um, there's some of his manuscript maps uh, in I think the New Hampshire Historical Society and a few other places. Um, but it's a the fun little map thinking about uh, a very different tourist perspective on the White Mountains. Yeah, that's great. And I, I love that uh, idea of the, the, it's like a harbor view, but from a, a railroad. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're seeing these uh, from that corridor. And it's really, I mean, the, the, the talking about field sketching, um, obviously this map isn't super, uh, geographically accurate, but the um, the sketches of these mountains with the the flumes and the slides are really striking. Um, <laughs> Lovett was very talented uh, with his with his field sketching, um, and so you see the this kind of um, you know front view from uh, <laughs> from north of the mountains here, and uh, of course there's our famous old man in the mountain, uh, no longer there. <laughs> Yeah, he had his day. Yeah. <laughs> um, great. Um, and yeah, so I think that's a good that's a good map time for today. Unless cool. You other, Anything um, else coming up over at Harvard? Um, not really. The uh, uh, yeah, just I encourage everyone to go go to spend some time with bending lines and uh, and really explore it. The next week we'll have. Um, uh, Layla Bermeo, who's an uh, associate curator, curator at the MFA. She was talking about uh, a statue with a map on it, which I'm excited about. Awesome. Um, and as always, you can check out the schedule on 
on our website and and see the the people coming up super well it's great to all see right. you dave and yeah, nice to see, to see everybody you. out there um, yeah we'll see you all next week all right until next time all right take care